Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. God's ultimate purpose is to provide a family for Himself and a bride for His Son as His eternal companion to reign with Him forever and ever and ever. We know that from Ephesians chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 19. I want to talk a little bit about Israel, the wife of Jehovah. In the Old Testament, Israel is regarded as the wife of Jehovah. Uh, we know that from Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea. But that lovely relationship was defiled by Israel's spiritual adultery and unfaithfulness to her husband. Of course, uh, as bad as that sounds, if it was not for that, salvation wouldn't have come to us, the Gentiles. Jeremiah chapter 3 shows Israel being guilty of playing the harlot with many lovers. And in verse uh, 20 of chapter 3, Israel is compared to a wife who has turned away from her husband. Israel was a wife guilty of adultery, or is a wife guilty of adultery. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says Jehovah. And so she is now regarded as divorced, if, or at least separated from her husband. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Now folks, bear with me because this does get interesting and you're going to find out where your place is in all of this. There will be a glorious future restoration of Israel to her husband. The restoration of Israel as Jehovah's wife is described in Isaiah chapter 54, verses 1 through 8. And the remarriage is further described in Isaiah chapter 62, uh, Hosea chapter 2, which depicts the courtship and the wooing in the wilderness and shows the many results of the reunion. Now, in contrast, the church, that's you and I, members of the body of Christ, the church, we are the bride of Christ. Paul, in addressing the Corinthians, says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now language like this could not be used of Israel. Israel will be forgiven and restored as the repentant wife of Jehovah, but not as the chaste virgin bride of the Lamb. So there's a distinction that we have to make between the wife of Jehovah and the bride of Christ. The relationship between Israel and Jehovah is dramatically different than that of Christ and His bride. Perhaps the most significant difference is that the marriage of Jehovah to Israel occurred in time past, whereas the marriage of Christ with His bride has not yet taken place. And this is what we anticipate as believers in Christ as we await the translation of the church. The great doctrinal passage of the bride of Christ in the New Testament is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 33. In His affectionate relationship, seven ministries are outlined which Christ performs for His bride. In the past, He loved the church and He gave Himself for it. Now this, this reaches from eternity past up to the cross. In the present, He sanctifies, cleanses, nourishes, and cherishes it. 
I hope that if you, I just I ask that you pay close attention to this because this gets really good at the end here. In the future, Christ presents the church to himself. Revelation chapter 19, we know from the 19th chapter of Revelation, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The righteous act of the saints. We have been imputed with Christ's righteousness, all righteousnesses of the Lord. Then he said to me, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. The marriage and the marriage supper of the Lamb are described in the 19th chapter of Revelation. The fact that she is called the Lamb's wife shows that the marriage has already taken place. Already taken place. The marriage takes place in heaven. The supper will take place on earth at His second coming. And we, we want to make sure that we distinguish between these two realities. Many will come from the east and the west to take their places at the banquet. We read that in Matthew chapter 8. In John chapter 3, John the Baptist, referring to Jesus, said, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. John the Baptist, John the Baptist who preached the gospel of the kingdom, which was postponed, which is preached again after the church is gone. He was the for, forerunner of the Messiah, and as the last of the law and the prophets, he didn't regard himself as part of the bride. He called himself the friend of the bridegroom. The fact that John the Baptist calls himself the friend of the bridegroom in the third chapter of John indicates that he and the glorified Old Testament saints called the spirits of just men made perfect in Hebrews and the tribulation saints, the tribulation martyrs, would be among the guests at the wedding. Okay? Now the word bride is used three times in Revelation 21 and in chapter 22. The first two occurrences refer to the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending, coming down from God out of heaven, In the closing verses of the Bible, we find the third mention. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, we're told of the present yearning on the part of the bride for her bridegroom, the love of her life. Think about it, folks. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. To the dearest object of his heart and eye, Jesus replies in verse 20 and says, Yes, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. This is what we anticipate as the body of Christ. The second advent of Christ, the Old Testament tribulation saints re resurrected, the heavenly city, New Jerusalem above, the resurrected King David on the earthly throne. Uh, exciting times ahead. Now, I want you to listen close. In many New Testament passages, 
the relation between Christ and the church is revealed by the use of the figures of the bridegroom and the bride. We know this from John chapter 3, Romans 7, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and even, even the book of Revelation. At the rapture, Christ, I want you to understand this. At the rapture, Christ is appearing as a bridegroom to take His bride unto Himself so that the relationship that was pledged might be consummated and that the two might become one flesh. When is this going to happen? Well, the time of the marriage is revealed in Scripture as falling between the rapture of the church and the second coming. Prior to the rapture, the church is still anticipating this union. Perhaps you know what that's like. According to Revelation chapter 19, this marriage has taken place at the time. It's already, had, it's already taken place at the time of, of His second coming, the second advent, because the declaration is, is the marriage of the Lamb is come. The aorist tense translated is come signifies a completed act. This marriage is seen to follow the events of the judgment seat of Christ. The marriage follows Bema. Okay? For when the wife appears, she appears in the righteousness of the saints. Revelation 19, which can only refer to those things that have been accepted at the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore, the marriage itself must be placed between the judgment seat of Christ, which happens after the rapture, and the second coming, the second advent. It's Bema, it's rapture, Bema, then marriage. Okay? The place of the marriage can only be in heaven since it follows the judgment seat of Christ, which is in the heavenlies. Okay? And it, it is from the air the church comes when the, the Lord returns in chapter 19 of Revelation. The Lord comes back. We come back with Him. The marriage must take place in heaven. No other location would fit a heavenly people. That's what we are according to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. A heavenly people. That's what we are. As far as the participants in the marriage of the Lamb goes, as far as that goes, it is an event which evidently involves only Christ in the church. We know from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and Isaiah, and Isaiah uh, chapter 26, 19 through 21, that the resurrection of Israel and the Old Testament saints will not take place until the second advent of Christ. That's when they're raised. And tribulation saints will not be resurrected until that time also. The marriage of the Lamb is an event that has particular reference to the church and it takes place in the heavenlies. It takes place in heaven. The marriage supper or feast is an event that involves Israel and takes place on the earth. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 24, as well as Matthew chapter 25. Now, on earth, where Israel is awaiting the return of the bridegroom and the bride, both. This, this is interesting to me. I, I, I hope you find it as interesting as I do. The wedding feast or supper is located on the earth and has particular reference to Israel. The wedding supper then becomes the parabolic picture of the entire millennial age to which Israel will be invited during the tribulation period 
which invitation many will reject because they're not elect, okay, and be cast out, and many will accept and be received because they are God's children, God's elect. And because of that rejection, the gospel will likewise go out to the Gentiles so that many of them will be included. Israel at the second coming, the second advent, will be waiting for the bridegroom to come from where? From the wedding ceremony. And invite them to that supper at which time the bridegroom will introduce his bride to his friends, Israel. Ever been to a wedding? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Now, folks, this is a love story. That's what this is. It's a love story. In reference to the announcement in Revelation 19.9, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are they. So distinction is made between or we need to make a distinction between the marriage supper, which is in heaven and celebrated before Christ returns, and the marriage feast, Matthew chapter 25, uh, Luke chapter 12, which is on earth after His return. The marriage of the Lamb is that event in the heavens in which the church is eternally united to Christ. The marriage feast or marriage supper or banquet, if you will, is the millennium to which Jews and Gentiles will be invited, which takes place on the earth, during which time the bridegroom is honored through the display of the bride to all his friends. Marvelous. What exciting times await us. The church, which was God's program for the present age, is now seen to have been raptured or translated, resurrected, and presented to the Son by the Father and has become the object through which the eternal glory of God is forever manifested. This present age, the present age, our generation may witness the completion of God's purpose in what Acts chapter 15 verse 14 says, taking out a people for His name. I love you all. I truly do. Keep looking up. We're going home soon. Join us on Sunday as we continue our study verse by verse through the book of Galatians. Until then, rest in Him. And thanks for watching.